Bibles, if you will, and go to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. Welcome to our online audience today. We're so glad that you are worshiping the Lord with us. A very significant day. It's a very significant day. Hebrews chapter 4, if you have it, say amen. We're going to begin reading at the verse, the 14th verse. And we are going to read just the 14th and the 15th verse there. The Bible says, seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. Ooh, isn't it good to know that you have a God that knows exactly how you feel. Even when you can't articulate it. Even when you can't find the words to say it. He knows. And he knows and he cares. He was in all points tempted like as we are. That means everything that we've ever been through, he experienced it. And yet he did it without sin. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. For the next few moments, I want to just talk from the subject. He knows the feeling. Look at somebody next to you and just tell them he knows the feeling. What, what do I mean? The thing you're feeling right now. The thing that made the tear come down your eye in the middle of the night. The frustration that is boiling inside of you. The fear, the anxiety, the excitement. There is nothing that he did not feel. And he went out of his way to feel it. For who? For you. For the face that you looked back at in the mirror this morning. That was the man and the woman that he did it for. Let's pray. Spirit of God, I love you today and I thank you for this gathering. Thank you for calling us and drawing us. That means there must be something in this today for me. Lord, I thank you for loving us enough to die for us. Thank you for your body that was broken for us and your word, your word that is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Somebody in this room needs to know where to put their foot next. I believe your word is going to help us today. Somebody don't know which way to turn, but I believe that your word will bring light. The entrance of the word brings light, illumination. Illuminate our path today. Somebody is at the end of their rope. Somebody don't know where to turn next. So we've turned to you. And we set aside this day to pull our chair to your table and say, feed us, Jesus. Feed us till we want no more. And so we praise you right now in advance for the food we are about to eat. In the name of Jesus, somebody clap your hands and help me tell God thank you. Look at your neighbor and tell him you don't have to have manners. Just eat up today. Just eat up. If you see something, you won't reach for it. Pull it down. Just eat up today. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Today is our day as believers because it is the day that we celebrate the death, the resurrection, and the, bur the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is the day that we celebrate. Uh, not only do we celebrate what we would call uh, his death, burial, and resurrection, but included in that was our spiritual emancipation. Because before Calvary, we were slaves. I said before Calvary, we were slaves. But because of Calvary, today you and I are free. And the Bible tells us that he that the Son sets free is free indeed. So Easter Sunday morning is an awesome occasion 
for those of us whose sins have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. It is an awesome day for us to gather together, and yet it is also uh, a most predictable day for people who always come to church on Easter Sunday because I'm guaranteeing that people and pastors and leaders all, all over the world are talking today about our Savior. They're talking about how he was beaten with a cat of nine tails. They're talking about how he was crucified and how he died and how, he was, how, he, how they buried him and how he came up and was resurrected, how he conquered death, hell, and the grave. I said how he conquered death, hell, and the grave. And while, while all of that is true and while he did every last bit of that, uh, what I want to tell you today is that it is irrelevant to you if you do not know how to take what he did for you on that day and make it applicable in your life. You see, the story of Easter is really captivating. It is, it creates an excitement. It is not only exciting, but it is life altering and it is life changing. And it really does us no good, however, to hear the story and not be personally affected by the story. And so today, my question to all of you, whether you're in this room or online or in the balcony, I started to say the balcony. Hey, maybe we need a balcony. I don't know. <laughs> Wherever you are, whoever you are, my question to you today is how has Calvary affected you personally? We know that he has been resurrected, but my question to you today is has he been resurrected inside of you? For you see, Easter has got to mean more than just white patent leather shoes and, and Easter baskets and bunnies and egg hunts and, and going to church with your mama because you've been telling her all year, I'm coming, I'm coming, and she made you come on Easter Sunday morning. There, there has got to be more to the story than all of that. Look at somebody next to you and tell them there's more to the story. For Calvary, you see, is a result of God so loving the world that he gave. Not, not, not just the church, but he loved the world that so much that he gave his only begotten son. He gave his only begotten son for you and for me. And, and you see, Jesus was given, but he was given to us as a gift. A gift that could afford us redemption because we could not pay for it within our own self. So he had to purchase it for us. And he did all of that, not because he didn't love his only begotten son, because he did, but he also loved you and you and you and me and all of us today. He loved us in our sin. He loved us. And can I tell you today that he proved that he loved you before you ever had the power to praise him. I, I understand you're the biggest praiser in the church today, but before you could ever praise him, he loved you in all of your mess. Before he ever knew your name, before he, you ever knew your mama, he knew you and he knew every sin you would ever commit. And, and before you could ever say, Lord, thank you, he said, I love you. I love you. I got you covered. He loved you and he loved me just as I was, just as you were. He loved us in our sin. He loved us in our mess and he loved us in all of our pain. And you know, it's not easy to love people who are in pain. It makes it hard. Bishop has had so many surgeries and his, uh, he, he has been up through a lot of pain. And, and I, I've tried to be right there by his side. And, and I would try to help him move a certain way. And he'd say, oh, oh, oh. And I knew that I must have been touching him in the wrong place. So because he was in pain, it was hard for me to help. It's, sometimes it's hard to help people that are hurting. Uh, and, and yet he went to great lengths to help us in our pain. He spared absolutely no expense because of our pain. And he did it because he loved us. He freely gave his life because he loved us. For God who is rich in mercy. Uh, for his great love where he hath loved us. The Bible said. And he loved us when we were dead in our sins. I know you're holy today. And I know everything's right between you and your maker. But there was a day. Yeah, y'all better own it. There was, there was 
Pastor. Okay, Pastor Brady. There was a day. There, there really was a day. There was a day that you were dead in your trespasses. There was a day that you were dead in your sins. He said, I loved you even then. I loved you when you were dead, when you were unresponsive to me, when I would wake you up in the midnight hour and you would not even respond, when you were cold, when you were indifferent, when you were lifeless, when you were incapable of loving him back. He said, I loved you then. He said, I kept loving you through all of that and I kept drawing you and I kept calling your name. I kept talking to you. I called you out of darkness and into the marvelous light. I called until I got on your last nerve. I called you in your sin. I, I, you were in sin, but I kept talking to you. I kept dialoguing with you. You were in the club, but I was talking to you. Yeah, you were doing what was wrong, but I was talking to you. You were hurting yourself. You didn't even love yourself, but I love you so much that I kept talking to you. Everything that you went through when you felt like you were alone, I would remind you, hey, lo, I am with you always because I just knew that if I would talk to you, that you would remember who you were, that you would remember that you were born for more than this. You would remember that you are better than where you are. So I kept talking to you. I talked you out of death and into life. I talked until you knew that it was me. I talked until you recognized my voice. I talked until we connected. I talked until I saw signs of life coming out of you. I talked until the light went on. I talked until you woke up. I talked until you responded to me. I talked until you got up and started moving. I talked until you realized how valuable that you are. I talked until I brought your self-esteem up off the floor and gave you a reason to live. I talked you into loving yourself again and loving your loved ones again. Whatever it is that is trying to destroy you or was trying to destroy you, I talked until you came out of it. Look at somebody and tell him he'll talk you out of it if you'll let him. You'll talk you. Y'all didn't tell him. Tell him. Tell him. <laughs> He'll talk you back up on your feet again. You know, you don't have to admit that life has ever knocked you off your feet, but there is a God that if it does, he will talk to you when people won't get you up. He is a God that will come to where you are. He'll talk until you can feel again, until you can sing again, until you can hope again, until you can trust again, until you can love again. He will talk until he silences every voice that's trying to override his voice in your head. He will talk until you believe again. And he does it all because of love, because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And when that revelation really gets inside of you, and then you will begin to realize that when you got him, you when you got him, you got everything that you will ever need, which means you don't have to kiss up to nobody, which means you don't gotta play games to anybody with anybody. You don't have to beg anybody, you don't have to plead with anybody. Cause when you got him, you got everything. Oh, he's better than bunnies and baskets and eggs and new clothes and a new shirt and a new tie and a new hat because when you got him you got the giver of all gifts and you got the giver of life Woo. you got you got the master you got the owner of your next breath you got the rabbi that's what Nicodemus called him Nicodemus called him a rabbi you are a teacher he said teacher I know that thou art sent from God for no man can do these things unless God is with him. Nicodemus was right. He is a teacher for he said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Take my yoke upon you and 
learn. Yes, I am a teacher and you can learn of me for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. In other words, don't stress out over what you don't know because the teacher is on board. The teacher will teach you everything that you need to know. When you find yourself in a position that you feel unqualified for, just remind yourself that the teacher, the master, the rabbi is inside of you and he'll talk you through everything. He said, I will teach you whatever you need to know. I am the one, by the way, that taught the earth to turn on its axis. I taught the stars how to twinkle. They couldn't twinkle until I said, twinkle, twinkle, little star. I taught the sun. Now it's your time. Rise, rise, get up. Now it's your time to sit down. I taught the moon to shine so it can light up the darkness of the night. I taught the rain how to fall. I taught the wind how to blow. I taught that little insignificant snowflake how to bind itself together with a bunch of other snowflakes and then it could become so powerful that it would stop traffic in the middle of the road. I am the teacher and whatever I say has been said for my word is forever settled in the heavens. That means whatever he says is so and all that we can do is say amen and amen. Woo. If he says it is day, it is day. If he says it is night, it is night. If he tells you it's going to be all right, I don't care how many devils in hell tell you it ain't. It is going to be all right. If he ever tells you that no weapon formed against you shall prosper, you better know that it will not prosper. If he ever tells me I'm blessed, then guess what? I'm blessed. If he ever tells me I am healed, then I am healed. If he ever tells me that I am free, then I am free. Because it is whatever my teacher says it is. Teach me, oh God. Teach me your ways. My Savior is not just a Savior, but my Savior is a teacher. My Creator is not just a Creator. My Creator is my teacher. My God is not only my God, but my God is my teacher. And if He can teach the sun to shine and the grass to grow, and if he can teach the trees how to yield their fruit, if he can teach fish how to swim, if he can teach birds how to fly, if he can teach eagles how to soar above the storm, confront the storm, but yet get a second wind and rise up above the storm. If he can teach creeping things to creep, then surely God can teach you and he can teach me everything that we need to know. So we came to us as a teacher, the creator, the redeemer. He had to come to us and so he first had to change his clothes and he took off his pre-existent glory and he came to us. He came through 40 and two generations. He came out of the root of Jesse. Ooh, the root you come out of is important. He came out of the tribe of the lion of Judah. He came out of the seed of Abraham talking about lo I come in the volume of the book why am I coming to do the will of God Adam you messed up but I'm going to come to you ah Cheryl you messed up but I'm coming whatever your name is he said to tell you I am coming and here comes God exchanging a throne room for a stinky stable the it started to prophesy he is coming he is coming the angels begin to announce he is coming wounded for our transgressions bruised for our iniquities the chastisement of my peace is upon him and with his stripes we are here it comes unto us is born this day in the city of David a savior who is Christ the Lord oh and of his kingdom there shall be no end for he who was sinless for the sin of the world came to become sin so that you and I could know righteousness tell everybody around you he is coming he is coming here it comes here it comes here it comes 
Oh, but he needs a body. So he found him a young lady by the name of Mary. I know somebody is saying, this is not Christmas, Pastor Brady. This is Easter. But let me tell you something. If there were no Christmas, there could be no Easter. <laughs> so he found him a young lady in Bethlehem whose name was Mary. And she was about to be married to a man whose name was Joseph. He said, hold up though, hold up for a minute. He said, I need you to put that wedding on hold. I, I, need, you to put, I need you to put it on hold because before he can have you, Mary, I have got to have your help. And, and, I, I, and here's, the, here's the deal. I need a dressing womb, not a dressing room. I, I need a dressing womb. I need a place where I can go through the change that I need to go through. And so he... He, he, he said, can I borrow your body? It will only take me about nine months, but if you'll let me borrow your body, I can take off the old and, and put on the new. If you'll let me borrow your body, I, will, I, I can wrap myself up in the clothes of a servant. I can take on humanity. I climb in through immaculate conception, but I will climb out. Emmanuel, God with us. Tell somebody he's here, he's here, he's here. Now he is not coming, he is here. Our creator Creator, our teacher, our savior, our gift from heaven is here. Our gift came and he walked among us for 33 years and then he went to Calvary for us. And while he was in, on Calvary, the Roman soldier ripped the foil of his flesh and the New Testament blood began to spill out on the ground. And it was for this that he came. That was the whole point. He came to redeem mankind but before I want you to get this about him before he ever preached his first sermon he said I gotta get there and I gotta walk through what they are walking through because he knew he could never straighten you out and me out had he not been through it himself he, he wasn't like the other prophets because the other prophets they dwelled with the religious people but not him not Jesus he came into the the midst of a suffering people he came into the lepers den he came to those that were broken and he sat with people that religious people would never sit with he sat with wine bibbers and low lives and prostitutes and broken people and messed up people oh and let me tell you they talked about him like he was a dog how can he call himself a man of God and associate himself with such people as these but what they did not know is that he was so much more than a man of God he was God himself he was a teacher and he signed up for the class because he wanted to sit where I would sit he wanted to walk with where I would walk. He wanted to feel what I would feel. He wanted to hurt like you and I hurt. He wanted to be moved by the feelings of our infirmities. Now, I don't know about you. Oh, but I, I gotta know. I gotta know that he knows how I feel. I gotta know that he knows exactly what I'm facing. I got to know that if nobody knows, he knows what the tear meant when it rolled off of my face in my bed last night and it soaked my pillow. I need that kind of God. I need a God that can come to me when I cannot get to him. I need a God that understands that if he don't help me get up, I will not be able to get up. I need a God who can relate to me and not just with religious talk. I need a God who can come to, who is not afraid to come down to my level, who will not be, be nervous about coming down to where I am. That's the God that came. And when he came, he saw the self-righteous. He saw their arrogance. Arrogance. He saw them in the temple. It upset him so bad that he turned over the table. You know why he turned over the table, don't you? He turned over the table because he hated the injustice that he was seeing in that house. He, there ought to be something in us that when we see injustice, we turn the table over. Because
because our father turned the table over. When he came, he saw all of that. He saw religion at its worst. He saw prejudice. He saw discrimination. And he knew that that group would never be able to help this group with their false religion. And so he said to the father, I will go. I will go where no man can go, where no angel can go. I will help them. He came because he wanted to help you. He came because he wanted to help me. Oh, they can't help you, Cheryl, but I can help you. I'll get you out of it. If people won't get you out, I will. If your friends won't get you out, I will. If your mama won't even get you out, I will. If your family won't get you out, I will. I'll do what nobody else has the ability to do. Aren't you glad on this Easter Sunday morning that you have a God that can do what nobody else can do? That's why I couldn't wait to get here to praise him on this Sunday morning because when I, I couldn't get up to come to him, he came to me. When religion cut me out, he came to me. When the self-righteous wouldn't come, he came to me. When the holier than thou would not come, he came to me and he went out of his way to love Look at somebody and tell him he did it for you. He did it for you. He went out of his way to love me. He went out of his way to relate to me. He went out of his way to find me. And then he after, after they got him, he suffered rejection for me. He suffered failure for me. He suffered betrayal for you. He suffered loneliness for you. He suffered sickness for me. He suffered pain for all of us. They spit on him, but he took it. And he took it. Somebody say for me. They beat him and he took it. And he took it for me. They stripped him of his beautiful robe, seamless robe. It's as seamless as it closed. You know, clothes, you know, uh, they, they, they announce character. So if his clothes were seamless, you know his character was seamless. <laughs> they stripped him of his, that, that was probably his most prized possession on the earth. And they stripped him from it. And then they took a hand, put a crown of thorns in their hand, and they pressed it down. And they sliced his beautiful forehead. They pierced him in his side. And guess what he did? He took it all. And he never said a mumbling word. I said he never said, God help us for all the mumbling words that we say over things that are so much less than what you went through. He died, oh, but he died like the king that he was. I said he died like the king that he was. He took it, I said he took it, and even when his friend Peter uh, tried to stop him, he turned around and said, Peter, shut your mouth and get behind me, Satan. Sometimes your friends are being used by Satan, and you gotta know, Peter was saying, you don't have to die, you don't have to take that all, but he so he called Peter Satan and said get behind me listen let me tell you something Peter if you are gonna go with me then you got to let me be the lead and you ain't running the show Peter I am running the show you ain't driving this thing I am driving it Peter so get yourself in the back seat that's what he said get thee behind me cuz thou savor is not the things of God but you're savoring the things of man. In other words, what he meant was you don't have the mind of God in this matter, Peter. I love you and you're my friend, but you don't have the mind of God because you think you can run from suffering. But let me tell you, Peter, you have got to embrace suffering. You have got to allow yourself to feel 
what you have to feel. And if any man is saying he's coming after me, he has got to deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And any time you are always thinking about your desires and your dreams and yourself and your your reputation and your feelings. Anytime you're always thinking about you, then that is the enemy that is working within you. Thou savorest not the things of God. You're not thinking about God. You're thinking about you. You're not setting your affections on things above. You are setting your affections on yourself. Jesus was teaching them. He was spelling out the requirements. In fine print, by the way, the requirements for discipleship. He said, I'm going to die. And if you're going to be a part of my ministry, you die in two, Peter. Because the real truth of the matter is, is you cannot be a disciple if you are not willing to die. Your flesh has got to be crucified. I said your flesh has got to be crucified. You got to nail it down. If you don't nail it down, you'll never see your purpose. I came to talk to you straight today because I don't know when you're going to come back. But while you're here, I'm going to wash my hands so the blood ain't going to be on my hands. <laughs> Your flesh has got to submit to the cross. Somebody's wondering, why can't I get my business off the ground? Maybe it's because God says something first has to die. And let me tell you something. Even if you do attend church every Sunday and you put your m money in the church and you volunteer your time and, and, and you call yourself a proud member at the the end of the day if the leader cannot lead you then because you are not willing to die then guess what I can't kill myself trying to lead you the reason I say that I can't lead you is because you start kicking and you start crying and fussing and arguing and, and you start fighting against God and fighting against anything that tries to restrain your flesh let me tell you something I can't fight you and lead you at the same time because I'm not going to kill myself trying to kill you. I am not, I promise you, I'm not the pastor that's going to follow you around town and take notes and say, I saw you on Saturday night when you went into the club. I saw you. I'm not, I'm not that one. If that's what you want to do, you do it, okay? If that's you, then you do what you want to do. But I will tell you one thing. I'm not checking you out to see if you're living right, acting right, talking right, walking right, because he didn't call me to do that. He called me to love you. He called me to lead you. He called me to feed you. He called me to grow you. He called me to be instant in season and out of season to reprove and to rebuke with all long suffering and when helping you you start hurting me, I'm out, baby. Because I got a flesh of my own to fight. Woo. Your flesh is not my battle. Your flesh is your battle. Look at somebody and tell them, you better fight your own. Fight your own. Get a grip of your flesh. Because if you don't get a grip of it, it will rob you of your future. It will rob you of your purpose. It will rob you of your destiny. It will rob you of your years. Tell your flesh, you are going to listen. You are going to shut up. You are going to respect. You are going to learn. You are going to say yes to the correction of the Lord. I will nail you down until you die. Oh, we are waiting for God to deliver us. But the truth of the matter is we are supposed to mortify the deeds of our flesh. We, we, we are waiting for God to sap us yes. so that we no longer want 
what we shouldn't want. I'm waiting on God to help me not to want what I shouldn't want. But that is not deliverance. Deliverance is not when you don't want it anymore. Deliverance is saying no while you're still wanting it. Y'all ain't gonna help me. Hey, look at somebody and tell them, deny yourself. You got to deny yourself. You got to stop catering to your flesh and your fleshly ideals. Stop being so touchy and so petty and so moody. Stop. Oh, time out for all of that. Look at somebody and tell them, deny yourself. For whosoever will come after me must, he must deny himself and take up a cross. He didn't say take up a cross. He said he must deny himself and take up his. Oh, you know what that tells me? That tells me that the cross is personal. That means everybody's got one, baby. I said everybody's got a cross, and a cross is designed to kill your flesh. And we all have something in our life that is designed to kill our flesh. Now, my cross is not your cross, and your cross is not my cross. But God knows exactly what kind of cross you need in, to, for, in order for you to die. Your cross might be a troubled marriage. Your cross might be money issues. Your cross might be a rebellious child. Your cross might be a sickness that you cannot seem to get over. Your cross might be an unfaithful spouse. It's not something, let me tell you something, a cross is not something that you wear on your neck that looks beautiful. A cross is something that you bear. And if you're wearing one today, that's okay. As long as you bear what you wear. A cross represents your struggle. It represents your pain. It represents your tears. It represents the one thing that you can't get together by yourself. So therefore, it makes you pray. It makes you cry. Yes, 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 yes. It makes you nail yourself down. And it makes you say, God, I can't get through this if you don't help me. Jesus bore his cross and he submitted to his cross. Never once. Did he try to use supernatural power to bring personal comfort? (laughs) I say it again, never once, somebody in the lobby hear me, never once did he use supernatural power that he could have used so that he could bring personal comfort to himself. One wave of his hand and he could have took off the head of the soldier who was about to press the crown of thorns into his skull. But guess what? He did not do that. He, they tried to give him something to drink before he got on the cross and they wanted to mix it with myrrh. But when he realized that it had myrrh in it, he said, no, thank you. Because myrrh has a way of numbing your feelings. And he said, I don't want to go to the cross and sell the people short. I want to feel everything that they would feel. The same hand that stilled the water. The same hand that cleansed the temple. The same hand that formed mankind. The same hand that took down Babel's tower, the same hand that split the Red Sea, the same hand that touched the mud that put in the eyes of the blind man and he gave him his sight back. That same hand did all of the miracles and he could have clenched his fist when they came at him.
him with the nail. He could have resisted it, but he didn't because it was easier for him to bear your sin in the earth rather than to bear the thought of your hopelessness all throughout eternity. And he knew, he knew that when he died, your sin would die too. He knew that when he rose, your hope would rise too. He knew that when he left his grave, your grave would never be permanent housing for you. <laughs> he knew it would only be temporary housing. <laughs> so he died. He was dying, but he was on public display. Is your cross got you out in the open? Mm -hmm. Are people watching you die? Did God put your business in the street and now you're dying on, on public display? Dying in public is painful. It can be embarrassing. I'm a marriage counselor, but I'm looking for a divorce attorney. Dying on public display. I'm working in the children's ministry, but my own child, I feel like I can't even help them. I'm dying on public display. I've been laying hands on the people of God everywhere I go. And I find out that I have a diagnosis. That if the Lord doesn't help me, well. I can heal them, but, but I will die of this thing. I'm a youth pastor, but my 13-year-old daughter Mama. is having a baby out of wedlock. It's embarrassing, but I'm trying to say to you is it's embarrassing to die in a public place. Oh, trust me, I know, I know, I know, I know. When you're on a cross, people are looking. It's embarrassing. So pastor, can you help us? Can you show us how to die gracefully? The only counsel I can give you is to tell you to shut up and bear it. Just shut up. Look at somebody, it ain't nice, it ain't polite, but tell them, Shut up and bear it. But pastor, this cross is killing me. I know, I know it is killing you. That is the point. Well, how long do I have to take this till you die? That's how long you have to take it. You have to take it until you can say, Father, into your hands do I commend my spirit. For as long as you're alive and as long as you keep letting people rescue you and as long as you keep climbing down off the cross when your pain gets unbearable, every time you do that, you have to start the whole process over again. And to be honest, some of us are getting way too old to have to be continuously starting the same process. You're losing time. You're delaying your Self. Oh, we just need to shut up and die. We need to shut up and quit looking for empathy. Quit looking for somebody to take our side. Quit looking for somebody to build a case to. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Take up your cross and become obedient unto death. But Jesus said, no man takes my life. I'll take it myself. You want to die gracefully? Then follow him. Follow his example. He was nailed between two thieves. And while they were whining and complaining, while they were losing it on their cross, he was leading from his cross. <laughs> Sometimes you gotta be nailed to your cross and still keep doing the will of God. He 
was nailed to a cross, but he kept doing the will of God. Sometimes you got to be broke and still call him Jehovah Jireh. You are my provider. Sometimes you got to be sick and still call him Jehovah Rapha. Sometimes your children are sick and you got to stand over them and say, Jehovah Rapha, you are our healer. Sometimes you got to be confused and say, Jehovah Shalom, you are my peace. Sometimes you got to feel abandoned and alone and still say, Jehovah Shama, he is here. He is present. He was preaching from his cross. He was executing people's destiny. Son, behold thy mother. Mother, behold thy son. Your sins are forgiven. And this day you will be with me in paradise. You got to be on a cross and still keep going. Look at somebody and tell them, keep going. Keep going. I know you're dying, but keep going. I know you're hurt but keep going you're embarrassed but keep going you're grieving but keep going because you cannot quit doing what you're called to do just because you have a cross Jesus just kept on working I'm almost finished he kept talking up while he was going down. Have you ever had to just keep talking up while everything inside of you was going down? Have you ever had to keep answering questions when you felt like your mind was a blank slate? He kept answering questions. He kept giving direction. He kept interceding. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And when he had accomplished everything that he was assigned to do, the most cut wrenching cry of loneliness in all history came from a hill from a man called the Messiah who is nailed to the cross. And he hollered out, my God, my God, you're not just anybody's God, you're my God. Why have you forsaken? Why you? Out of everybody, why? You! Never in history, never in history have words carried so much pain. Never has anyone ever felt so alone. Every lie that was ever told would be on his shoulders though he never lied. He never committed adultery, but every weight and sin of every adulterer was on his shoulders. Every pain any of us will ever feel, every sin committed is on his shoulders. He's bearing the weight of the world. He's bearing the corporate sin of the world. So of course, he is bearing the corporate pain of the sin of the world. He, by the way, can I remind you, who had no sin, has now become sin because of me. And when he becomes sin, God, turns his head. And now the Father and the Son, the two who had been one, 
have now become true again. Jesus, who had been with God throughout all eternity, now he's alone. If you ever needed God before, I'm paying a price for somebody else's problems. He needed God, but he had to go through that feeling of aloneness. The Christ, who is an expression of God, has been abandoned. You ever been abandoned? And their unity is dissolved. And when it is, it is more than Jesus can take. It's just more than he can take. I took the beatings. I took them beating me all the way up the Via Dolorosa. I took the whipping from the cat of nine tails. I've got scars throughout my entire body. I took the ones that I loved running away from me. I took the insults. I took the spit when he spit, when they spit on me. I looked down at my feet and I watched them take my seamless robe. And I took every bit of it. I took it. I took it. I didn't take no, nothing to numb me either. I went through it all and I felt it all. But God, when you turned away, I'm just being real. It was more than what I could handle when I couldn't sense you, when I couldn't feel you. It was more than I could handle. And the words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Came from lips that were so parched. His holy heart had been broken. And out of the desert of his loneliness, he screams, why, why you? Why you? I mean, out of everything and everybody. Why did you abandon me? I'll tell you why today. Because he would rather go to hell for you than go to heaven without you. And so he died. I said, and so he died. Oh, when they, when they started the thing, they were mocking him. Oh yeah, they were mocking him, but by the time it was over, the sky grew dark. The sun refused to shine. The veil in the temple tore from the top all the way down to the bottom, giving you and me access into the Holy of Holies. He died until the earth began to shake. Ain't nobody mocking now. Ain't nobody laughing now because the graves were burst open and you could see people who were in those graves are now walking the streets of Jerusalem he died until the power of sin was broken until every curse was nailed to the tree and until every man who was ever guilty could go free and I'm finished, but I gotta tell you this because if I don't tell you this, it ain't Easter. So I've gotta tell you that he died. Tell somebody he died, he died. He died until the sun refused to shine. He died until mercy and truth kissed each other. He died until the law slid over and stepped into grace. He died until every ordinance became an opportunity. He died until every curse turned into a blessing. They laughed at him, but he died. They 
mocked him, but he died. He could have called 10,000 angels, but he died. He could have saved himself, but he died. And not only did he die, but after he died, he went down into the lower parts of the earth and he confronted Satan and he said, I'm here to get something from you that belongs to my people. I will take those keys from you. And I came on this Easter Sunday morning to tell somebody that God has the keys that you need. And whoever has the key, has the power. And what you bind on earth, I will bind in heaven. And what you loose on earth, he's got the key. everything in your life that's locked up. He's got the key to your broken marriage. He's got the key to your broken heart. He's got the key to your rebellious child. He's got the key to your financial issues. He's got the key to your low self-esteem. He's got the key to your habits. He's got the key to your career. He has the key to everything in your life. Whatever you need open, he's got the key. And not only did he die for you, not only did he go to hell, strip the keys of the kingdom from Satan, he was buried for you too. But guess what else? He got up for you. He is risen. He is no longer here. He is risen. And if that same spirit, Prophetess Calloway, that raised Christ from the dead dwell in you, it will Quicken your my mortal body. Look at somebody and tell them you're coming out too. You're coming out too. Out of every habit, out of every addiction, out of every cycle, out of every sin, out of every sickness, out of every pressure, out of every pain, out of every discouragement, out of depression, out of suicide, out of self-harm, out of everything, out of brokenness, out of loneliness, out of fear, out of rejection. Pull somebody and say, come out of it. I came on this Easter Sunday to tell somebody, come out and dream again. Come out and desire again. Come out and hope again. Come out and trust again. Come out! Give yourself permission to try again, to find courage again, to dig up the gifts that you have buried. Find the courage to hope again, to live again. But you don't know, Pastor Brady, you don't know what I've been through. You're right, I really don't. I know I don't, but I wanna tell you he does. <laughs> he knows every pain, he knows every tear. He knows the thing that's making you toss and turn. He knows everything for we have not. A high priest. 
which cannot be touched by the feelings of our infirmities. So therefore, let us come boldly. Let us come boldly where? To the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace in the time of need.